Okay, so this is going to be a video about wave particle duality. So there's two different sides to look at this. We need to look at waves behaving like particles, and the particular wave that we look at in, in this sort of course is light waves acting as particles. And then after that, we're going to come on to look at particles behaving as waves. So and uh, and how they demonstrate that. So I think one of the key things to establish here is what are properties of particles and what are properties of waves. So in terms of waves, what we talk about in terms of their properties is their ability to diffract and interfere. That's what we're looking for when we talk when we talk about wave property properties of things, their ability to diffract and to interfere with each other. Okay. So that we know that light can do this. So light clearly has some wave-like properties. But there's one key property which leads to the suggestion that it has particle properties as well. And that is the photoelectric effect. Now if you want a bit more detail on this, I am going to dissect the photoelectric effect and stopping potential sort of things in another video. But in this one I'm just going to talk about how it's used as evidence for that. So some, some basic concepts from the photoelectric effect. You've got one-to-one -one interaction between the photons of radiation and the electrons of an atom. So you shoot one photon in, it can only cause one electron, or well, one photoelectron, to be emitted. That's a key part of the photoelectric effect. Second thing is the, the emission of the electrons is nothing to do with the intensity of the incident radiation. So we say it's independent of that. So if light behaved just as a wave, if you cranked up the intensity in theory, you should change the uh, the emission of the electrons. But that's not what happens. We have this thing called a threshold frequency, which is one of the key evidence pieces to suggest that light acts as a particle in the photoelectric effect. So that's light acting as a particle. So let's move on to have a look at particles acting like waves. And this all comes to a guy called De Bruyne. I mean, a lot of people call him De Broglie, but he is, I think he's Dutch, I think. And he, his name should be pronounced De Bruyne, but that's not really important right now. And what he proposed is that particles have a wavelength tied to their momentum, or in, in this case, inversely proportional to the momentum of it. So what this wavelength sort of is trying to explain is that you never know exactly where a particle is. So it has, and they have a probability of occupying certain locations, and those are all tied into a and can be explained by a waveform principle. But you don't really need to know much detail about that. You need to know the this equation here, and obviously how it relates to wave properties of particles. So, I, like I said earlier, wave properties of particles are things like diffraction and interference. So you can get something like an electron to diffract if you pass it through a gap of similar size to their de Bruyne wavelength and that's quite a useful principle which I'm going to look at in the next slide in terms of electron microscope or more specifically a transmission electron microscope. So those are the, the key things that you need to know about the wave particle duality topic from the turning point section. So I'm going to have a look in a bit more detail at the t transmission electron microscope. Alright, so let's look at transmission electron microscopes, which we often abbreviate to TEM microscopes because physicists don't like saying long words very often. So we've got transmission electron microscopes, and these work using the principle of electron diffraction. So what we've got here on the left is at the top, we have a thermionic emitter because we need to have something that's going to be releasing electrons so when you pass a current through some, a filament you start getting electrons being emitted from it. So what happens next is it's accelerated through this potential difference here and I'm not sure why I've drawn this being positive up there, that is clearly negative, so sorry, that's a, a mistake I've made there. But it's obviously, the, you, this, the, if the tops are negative, the bottoms are positive, the electron is accelerated towards the positive side of your potential difference, 
well, so it, it gains a lot of kinetic energy and obviously high speed means it has very high momentum so then you start to um, you can start to ca calculate what your wavelength is for this electron so once it's reached high speed you pass it through the sample and then if the sample is nice and thin like a sheet of foil for instance what you get is the electrons diffracting at different angles through it it's starting to sound a little bit like a um, obviously a diffraction grating because we're getting our n equals, n equals 0, n equals 1 order, n equals 2 order but you have an extra dimension in this because it's not going only going through slits it's now able to diffract in two different dimensions if you like so what you get if you put a screen behind it is what we have on the right here so you get this circle sort of shape and you get you get your n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3 just the same so obviously you need to be able to work out what your angle is so one of the things you can do is you measure the radius of one of your circles and you measure the distance from the screen to the sample and using a cunning bit of trigonometry you can work out what the angle is and then you can work out all sorts of cool things so if you have your electron fired at a certain a certain velocity you can work out what its wavelength is so knowing all these things you can work out what sort of like the atomic sort of separation size is and that sort of thing which is quite an interesting thing to know about material and that's what we use transmission electron microscopes for okay so I'm just going to quickly talk about the other kind of microscope the STM microscope or scanning tunneling microscopes and this uses a, a different principle to electron diffraction this is actually something completely different this is uses something called quantum electron tunneling and so what you have is you have some sort of probe that you move over the surface of a material and what you do is you apply a potential difference between that probe and your surface so you apply a potential difference across them and what happens when you do this is the electrons are then able to tunnel across the gap between the probe and the surface because, um, and that has an element to do with the De Bruyne wavelength of the electrons but I'm really not going to get into that because it starts to get very complicated. So when you've got this potential difference between, a, between your probe and your material the electrons can tunnel across. And the closer your probe is to the surface, the more the higher the probability of this tunneling effect. So you actually get a greater current going around your circuit. So obviously if you get a bigger current, you know that your probe is much closer to your surface. Or conversely, if you get a smaller current, it must mean it's further away from your surface. And if you map that if you map that across the whole of the material, you get quite a good picture of what the texture of the material is like. So there are two different types of this. You have uh, you can have a fixed height uh, tunneling microscope, and what that does is it moves the probe over at a fixed height and just measures the current at all points around the around the material. And obviously this has quite useful advantages, you don't need any mechanism for moving it up and down, and sort of th that sort of thing. That's quite useful. And the other one you have is a fixed current. So what happens is the probe will move over the material and it will measure the current and it will try and we try and making it a certain fixed value so it, the machine can move it, the probe, up and down until you get that certain fixed current and then it takes a, basically takes a reading of what the height of the probe is at that point. So those are the two different types of uh, scanning tunneling microscope. You've got your fixed height and you've got your fixed current. And they both basically produce an image of the surface of it so you get uh, how the height changes as it moves over the surface so you can see all the indentations and bumps on the material and that sort of thing.